Welcome everyone to our closing week program. A bittersweet moment really for me and I think for many of us in the room. And I am so pleased and can't really imagine uh, a better way of closing than to have this conversation with Sheena and with Reem, um, especially after you know some of our early conversations were with people who were uh, equally very dear to me in this journey of what has been the Diria Contemporary Art Biennale and the Diria Biennale Foundation. Uh, seeing the show Feeling the Stones by Philip Tenari and witnessing the reaction of locals and international art world alike has deeply moved me and made me realize just how important these narratives can be and these stories can be told. And so in this conversation, we'll be talking with Sheena and Reem about these you know, gendered narratives in the art world. And as being, of course, women yourselves, but also the way in which you work with women, whether they be your fellow curators, uh, you know, cultural thought leaders, but also artists, and how you have worked in these deeply traditional institutional settings, um, both of you, and, and Sheena and I first met when she was uh, the chief curator at Tate, and you know, again, you know, now and now at the Met. So again, these like very traditional uh, art world roles, but really shifting them. And I, I remember witnessing that at the Tate firsthand. And Nareem, you know, your work across the you know entire of the Middle East, and of course internationally also. But our worlds have brought us together so much here in the Arab world, and where people again like to traditionally you know say you know like this segregation of male and female and the lack of empowerment of you know the feminine in all ways so I think you know on that perspective is you know perhaps Sheena telling us a little bit about how you you know before the conversations of Me Too you were thinking about these things and including them um, in the work you do so how did how did you kind of push that narrative and and, and make it a part of your work well, thank you for the very generous introduction. I'm really happy to be on the stage with you, Alia, and also with Reem um, virtually. It's nice to see you. Um, and I think just before I answer your question, I just wanted to point out that in the audience, we have a predominance of women and two men, and everyone else at the back are all male. I think that pretty, is pretty illustrative right now of the fact that we still have quite a lot of work to do. Um, but I'm, I'm really, really happy that you guys are doing all the technical stuff. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but just to, to, your, to your question, um, and I think you're right. I mean, I, I think, you know, to, to speak to my experience here, which has been really extraordinary um, over this last mm, few days, um, it is so obvious to me that things have changed radically in Saudi Arabia. And it's very, um, you know, and I, Reem, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but one of the important things for me in developing a program, developing a collection, growing a collection with regard to actually not just the Middle East, but um, further afield across the world, and that is to grow a collection that is um, much more diverse than it has been, um, to create a program of exhibitions that reflect um, both um, uh, an acuity, I guess, of, of artistic production in different parts of the world by artists who happen to be women. And so when I uh, ran and managed the Breuer program, um, which was the Met Breuer, it was the old Whitney Museum on Madison Avenue, which I had the life of for five years. And in that program, um, I represented actually in the opening show, um, Nazri Mohammadi, along with a much larger historic show, and there have been many other exhibitions devoted to women. What's interesting is that, you know, in terms of sort of data, and again, please forgive me because I'm talking from a very specific perspective, which is, a, you know, a Western one, and being in New York, it's even more parochial than it normally is. Um, but I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that the latest data shows that still of those exhibitions that are that are um, presented by large museums with a, a kind of public facing responsibility it only amounts to about 18 to 20 percent at the very most of exhibitions devoted to art by women 
Um, and as a corollary to that, which I think is also very interesting, is that you know, we feel in the cultural world that we are sort of ahead of the curve in a way, which in some respects we are, but also you, we see women ascending in corporate culture. But it is a sad reflection of the fact that the Fortune 500 companies have a total of 8% of women in leadership positions, at top leadership positions. Um, and, you know, that's across the world. So I think that, you know, what we can do as curators is, um, is limited, but it nonetheless is incredibly important to represent art by women or art that happens to be by women in exhibitions such as the biennial here, actually, and to have the opportunity to do which is I've, what I've done since I've been here, which is to visit studios by some really fantastic artists who, um, in not just here, but also in Jeddah. Um, and I think that's, at least that is a sort of a, a start. It is about a conversation, really. And Reem, I think on, on that subject, I mean, you've been working with a, a great deal of female artists in the Middle East also. So these, this idea of studio visits, of, of course, artists who are living and who are many of them very young now, but the show you were discussing in which uh, Sheena and I know the artist well, Fakhr al Nisa Zaid, um, and also artists that you said just happen to be women from her generation, you know, who are now mostly past. Uh, that idea of it just happening to be women, but also looking at the historical and reframing that narrative that it wasn't just, oh, all of a sudden we now have young women artists. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say it's a great pleasure and apologies for not being there in person with all of you. I would have loved to be there, um, but you have to all excuse me because this is uh, for also health reasons. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, the subject is, uh, it's become very much who I am uh, at the same time about, you know, how we stand as women in within our field, but uh um, societally at large, um, and I want to say also sociopolitically. Um, I think I, I, for the longest time I've been oblivious in the Middle East, I would say oblivious really, growing up in Palestine and in several places in the Arab world where I had always seen women leadership. So um, when people talk about subjugation of women, my circumstance or my surroundings had proven else, you know, that this is not the case, um, uh, you know, and maybe this is not the norm elsewhere. Maybe we are not the norm, but um, inst the institutions I worked with uh, were all led by women uh, from a variety of institutions. Um, people ha had, you know, a lot of women have been enabled, had had a voice. Uh, uh, when I came back into Palestine in the uh, in the mid 90s during the elections of Yasser Arafat, his contender was a woman. Um, you know this this kind of uh, um, uh, let's say this entitlement of the role of women was always something as uh, uh, de facto within my surroundings. Um, uh, I come from a family of women that are quite strong and, uh, and enabled. And, and I think I carried that uh, outlook within myself. Um, and these are part of the stories that I'm trying to look into and to reference what you're talking about uh, specifically, um, uh, uh, Alia, is that, um, for example, ha having run the Cultural Foundation now for the past few years, our first show was Najat Maki, a retrospective of a woman artist in, uh, in the UAE that has had an amazing roster and an amazing and illustrious career and didn't get that kind of limelight yet. Um, and many others, not just you know female, but I would just say it was important for us to start with someone like Najat, influential um, uh, educator, uh, uh, artist, friend, colleague, um, uh, and definitely a progressive mind. Um, and m many shows later, we're opening next week on the 11th, Farah Al Qasimi, another, you know, uh, I want to say uh, limelight artist from the UAE itself, who's a resident of New York City uh, and has 
also proven um, to create a lot of edgy and progressive thinking and critical um, work around her um, environment and thought process. And the following show is another <laughs> cohort of women artists from, uh, from Jordan, particularly Fakhrin Nisa Zaid, who is exactly the example that I'm talking about. Fakhrin Nisa Zaid, uh, uh, Turkish, Jordanian, uh, married into the royal, royal uh, Jordanian family from the 60s and 70s was someone who uh, really kind of built a, uh, a cohort of women around her and uh, taught them art, and they have gone off to become the leading voices of women artists, and at the same time, those that have built the institutions in Jordan, uh, and from Dar al Fanun by Suha Shuman to, uh, uh, to others uh, like uh, Hind Nasser uh, who, uh, and Wijdan, who've had a really important role in shaping the uh, the museum, uh, the National Museum, the National Museum in Amman. So they had all a big role of kind of establishing these institutions and uh, and really had uh, 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 a kind of a seminal um, uh, impact. Uh, and it's it's all women basically. And that and I thought it would be due process to show that uh, that uh, entire heritage. So on that, I think the idea of you know, kind of threading the needle. And perhaps, you know, another conversation we had uh, with one of the, the guests who's also a, a curator at the Tate Modern was about, you know, adding these gendered perspectives can inform things in a different way. So it's not necessarily, of course, it is about correcting, you know, correcting an imbalance, but it's also about adding, um, adding to that narrative. And I think, you know, you have very strong feelings about that too. It's... it's <laughs> Well, I have. <laughs> um, you're correct. I mean, it, it, it's. Um, you've. I, I'd like to sort of talk about a couple of things actually. Um, and, Reem, just to your point that you've just made about you know, the leadership of women in the region and people like Suha Shoman, you know, who has done a great deal with her foundation and. Uh, you know, it. This is not. This is not necessarily consistent all the way across the region, but and certainly beyond as well. Is that thinking about this talk earlier on today? I was reflecting on the fact that you know there are many women who have founded museum and uh, founded museums and founded foundations, like for instance Gertrude Vanderbilt but Whitney, who founded you know a major museum or um, uh, Peggy Guggenheim, and both of those two women founders appointed female directors. Those kinds of histories get forgotten. But the other reason that they happen even is because they are initiated by people who are wealthy, who come from wealthy families. Zaid is another one. Um, those families who could afford to send their daughters to Paris to train in the early 20th century in the studio of Leger, or, you know, um, you know, it, there's there's an economic argument there, and I think that you know ultimately, while that happens, and that is a history that has been neglected to be you know to be acknowledged, it is still the case that that national institutions, whether in the United States or in the UK, it's a different situation in places like India where the national institutions are. Anyway, it's a different situation in India, um, but and there are that there aren't that many national institutions in any case that are funded by 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 government money, but at the same time they are still predominantly male. I mean, pr not predominantly, almost entirely male. So I so think the argument is that uh, pr private initiatives generally seem to be more precisely. female. Yeah, and so I I think you know there's. The economic parity is very important. You know, it is about, but it is more than parity, it's equity. And there's a difference between those two words. And I think that, you know, just taking it down to a granular level, you know, all of us work in offices in, with colleagues in different disciplines across, you know, the cultural sector and beyond. And I think really, to my comment at the very beginning, 
it's, this is not just about a, a conversation between women. It is a conversation that has to happen and be acknowledged and listened to by our male counterparts. And it has to be something that we work together on. It's, you know, it is a bias that needs to be changed. And I know it sounds ridiculously idealistic, but it's possible to do. I, I would absolutely agree. And, and I would say that I think in the context of what's happening here in the Middle East, there's so much radical change all at once that it's almost a, a kind of very fruitful platform and infertile platform for the idea of equity as well as parity uh, to go hand in hand. And Reem, I think maybe tracing back to some of the early days of you know your work in the UAE, and then of course coming to Saudi Arabia and uh, you know your recent work on Desert X. I mean, this idea of of creating a platform where I mean, do you really do you have to really think very hard about making things equal? I, I don't think. I think, of course, you're aware of it, but it almost comes as natural. Uh, I mean, as I said, uh, my surroundings have constantly been shaped by women uh, and by leaders, women leaders. Some uh, I definitely can, you know, contend to what um, uh, Sheena's saying about, you know, uh, many that have privilege or come from uh, uh, from wealth, but, and many who aren't. I have to say, Sheena, in my surroundings, at least, uh, uh, you know, Samiha Khalil, as I mentioned, the contender is a politician, and she was not someone of wealth. She uh, was uh, someone uh, who worked her way up and at the same time was still uh, garnered 11 point something of the votes against Yasser Arafat at the time. So uh, this is, you know, these stories are abound. We don't tell them enough. You know, we don't pride ourselves with that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, our, our cultural mission and, uh, uh, and let's say duty should be about uh, uh, promoting that, that ideas of leadership that are female oriented. Um, I, uh, I definitely, it does come to me naturally, uh, having been someone who, as I mentioned, I'm giving my dues back to a lot of these women in my society, but at the same time, uh, there is a concerted effort that I put. Uh, we're building the collection of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. We have been for the past 10 years, you know, creating a narrative that is based on equity and on uh, uh, female parity and equity is, is a huge thing for us. And it's a mission that we want to be able to, uh, to do. Um, uh, and you can see it, it's blatant, this kind of discrimination across that, I would say, structured uh, elimination that has happened across the years in the markets and in, in museums, uh, in the narrative. It's, uh, it's humongous. And uh, there's a big role for us to say, this is the time to reset that mission, um, uh, a, a permanent collection that can tell the story wisely and at the same time from the grounds up. Is, is, a, is, is also an important place to do that. Uh, this is a place for the narration of histories. Um, and these histories will, uh, uh, you know, will, be, uh, will be able to um, uh, uh, hopefully manage a dent in creating a better story for, uh, for, uh, for other female and especially female artists. In, but I have to say something that kind of I also want to talk about, you know, we have, we've had a lot of soldiers, uh, maybe unrecognized soldiers, but they are there. These soldiers, these women in the cultural field, in the po po political field, um, you know, these have been, you know, women that have done their work and spoken and, 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 uh, and, and really kind of stood their ground. Uh, one of them in Saudi has been Manal al-Duwayan. We all know her. She's been there constantly. Um, promoting uh, uh, women rights, uh, supportive of them, uh, um, you know, educating towards them, working uh, intimately with her society. Um, she's projected, you know, a narrative of a history that is progressive for her country. I think she's made it happen in many and, ways. And been you know, critical. Like, and, and been, and and critical. been thought, and at the same thoughtfully time, critical. She's yeah, she, she's manifested a reality that she's wished for her society. I mean, these are not, um, you know, we can't take these uh, 
the, the, those voices um, uh, uh, lightly. And at the same time, it's just important to give that full recognition to them. I mean, and I think if we look at the work of Manal's in, in the Biennale, uh, and you know, we think back to that time in, in the work for any of you who in the audience who have not seen it, um, and watching it from home now, hopefully years to come when you watch this video, uh, is you know of course about like female guardianship and and well sorry that in the, um, in the Biennale that was in 2139 the work in the Biennale is about uh, you know women tracing back a matrilineal a matrilineal line and I remember walking in with uh, a group at uh, the very early days of the Biennale and they said well that's not just a Saudi problem that's not just a, a you know an Arab problem or a Saudi problem it's you know, many women in a Western context couldn't trace back, you know, their mothers, grandmothers, uh, great grandmothers' names. So I think, in in a way, many of these themes are also universal. Of course, the guardianship uh, work, the doves, um, was uniquely Saudi for a very long time, but has also now changed. But is an important way of looking back at that time. And I and I think, you know, even if we look at these works as documentation, and think, okay, let's remember what that was like. I mean, I think, you know, Sheena, several of the artists you've worked with, I mean, it, it, in a historical context, it really. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I um, I agree with you completely, um, Reem, in that there are many soldiers, um, uh, you know, going out of the cultural ecosphere or uh, infrastructure or whatever, of course, there are m many who are notable, I mean, across the world, not just in this region. Um, I think that um, what's interesting to me is, and, you know, like you, we've been growing um, a collection and over the last, I don't know, since I've been at the, at the Met, nine years probably, um, trying to achieve um, a sort of a, a parity across the numbers of works that we acquire and works that, um, unlike the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York or um, elsewhere, we have, I know it sounds ridiculous, but we have very small acquisition funds. And so we're reliant a great deal on gifts or donations or bequests. And of course, that comes with it a lot of baggage because other collectors are collecting this work and then we accept gifts if, we, if it's good enough. And I, you know, so our, so it's it's not quite as focused or directed as I would like. But at the same time, we have been acquiring a huge amount of work by women across the world. One of the things that I don't want to dwell too much, you know, on time-wise, but you know, after after the murder of George Floyd in 2020, that was a um, a real stimulus and a sort of um, a reawakening, I guess, in, in the American community, and not just the American community, but the community at large, especially the English-speaking community, about the kind of the, the, the effects and ongoing trauma of colonialism and imperialism. And it, it, it is, you know, as, but this is not a conversation about that particular aspect. But what has been very interesting to me is in our collecting artists, um, work by artists of color who happen to be living and working in America but aren't necessarily American, there is a kind of propensity to, not just of this kind of documentary aspect um, and the great sort of long tale of history, but in an encyclopedic museum, we have a, an increased responsibility to deal with and to take account of those artists who, who deal with not just their personal history, but also the history of the regions or the countries in which they come from. And I'm not talking about nationalism, I'm talking about sort of cultural context more. Mm -hmm. And it's and I think that, you know, one of the things that the fact is you are collecting work by artists now that is going to be shown in a gallery next door to, you know, a work open, from, no. you know, yeah. a, you know, kind of an ancient part of, you know, what we would consider, you know, the non Western world, right? So and we get them up very quickly. I mean, so they're on the walls immediately. And it's within this context of 5,000 years worth of creative achievement by humankind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a very important point to make because many of the artists who, you know, you have collected, you've worked with that are in this biennial, um, 
women and men, but you know, women particularly, they draw on this kind of deep well of history that goes far beyond that kind of used to be 1900 divide. It's probably now the 1985 divide. I'm not quite sure where modern and contemporary sort of you know intersects now, but it's it's very important. I mean, so it's very interesting to me to see that artists are looking back in order to move forward much more than they ever were. And, I'm, and maybe that's because I'm, I'm in an encyclopedic museum, but I don't think it is. I think it's actually about a reckoning with a kind of turning point in so many ways in different cultural spots in the world. And this is one of them. Yeah, and I think actually it's a, an amazing link that the, you know, the idea of you know, black culture, whether it be, you know, of course we're talking about the murder of George Floyd was in, you know, in the US. Uh, but really a reawakening in many other contexts and countries. But also there is this alliance. I mean, just yesterday, uh, a friend was talking about how Lorna Simpson has been a, a kind of vocal uh, pro-Palestine uh, supporter and, and posting. And I think you see a lot of that alliance. And I think, you know, Reem, I think we had a brief conversation about that uh, around the time of, of, of George Floyd ourselves and about this you know, th this understanding of being in communities that, in the context of artists, maybe in, in Saudi Arabia, not marginalized, but perhaps not part of the mainstream, but very much in a black or a, you know, Palestinian context, marginalized. And those links are much more, are much stronger than we would realize, and those artists do look back. And Reem, maybe tell us a little bit. I think this is very much, you know, goes to your research. Um, and, and yeah. yeah, I mean, marginalization is exactly the point to what you and Sheena have rightfully put on this, uh, which, you know, of course, all our women's issues are um, at the core of that. Um, even in, you know, post-colonial worlds, um, if all these marginalized communities and nations and uh, women are in the kind of, I would say, in the very back backbone of those stratospheres um, that we're, we're, we're kind of calling for uh, the rights of all of them together and women just, it comes naturally with, with that call. Um, so I think that's something, um, uh, and, and again, it comes to my mind, uh, you know, the stories uh, from Palestine that uh, of women, uh, how much women started to um, stand for the struggle in Palestine. So all the subjugation that we were seeing across the years, uh, a lot of the women were the steadfast symbols used to represent land by artists, by female art, by male artists, by female artists, the voice of the woman, the mothers that were you know, would stand against uh, Israeli soldiers, et cetera. I mean, there was always this very um, crucial role for women um, in, in that larger narrative. And I think this is, you know, we see these images in black culture as well, the representation of the mother, uh, um, uh, you know, that which uh, really is trying to hold a lot of, um, uh, to hold the communities, um, um, I would say, with pride and to kind of move it forward and move them, the mission and the fight forward. Um, so again, back to our silent soldiers, there's a lot um, uh, to be said, but one thing I did wanna you know, kind of stress and talk about is that my outlook, let's put it that way, if, it, if, it, if it's just down to myself, and this is something I firmly believe in, in decolonization culture is an empowered stance. I, I, I'm not waiting to, to you know, have things given to me, I take. As a woman, I take. Uh, as a woman, I narrate. As a woman, I tell the story. For me, this is a very important kind of stance of self-affirmation, uh, of standing for my rights, of representing my female community and, and, and uh, mothers and women alike and workforce and soldiers, et cetera. This is an important uh, kind of stance in decolonization culture that I firmly believe in. Um, uh, and I, I think we've, we've long been, uh, and especially in the West, I was really kind of shocked in my early days, very young curator coming to New York City uh, in my late 20s and entering into 
you know, museums and seeing that there's a structural violence against women. You know, there's there's ways of how we've become the recipients. You know, we've been, uh, uh, our voices have been uh, emasculated. Um, and I, I felt, you know, this is something that I, I can see. And, uh, and I think decolonization, even in that, in those stances is, is absolutely necessary. We have to affirm our rights. We have to uh, stand for, you know, having women on boards. We have to make sure that we have parity in our collections for women. I mean, these are things that we have to do as a fait accompli. Uh, they have to become structural because God knows it has been a structural patriarchal segregation against us. So this is not something that we should not be aware of. And, you know, and, and we have to look into all of the laws um, you know, in, in God knows in, in, in the Arab world, you know, women are not allowed to, in Jordan, I was not allowed to give my daughter my, uh, my citizenship, my Jordanian passport. So, I mean, there's a, many issues that we need to fight the fight and make sure that we achieve. I think, you know, Sheena, kind of in the context of just what you were saying is like, you know, you can put things on the wall quite quickly. And in the context, especially of the Met, you know, and less so, of course, at Tate Modern, but when you're putting those things on the wall so quickly, how do you work with your colleagues who are working in the ancient, uh, you know, the ancient departments? I mean, how do those conversations, what are those conversations like? Well, um, you raise a very good point, and that, and, you know, to Reem's statement just now too, it's about finding a common language. And, you know, art historians are not the easiest people in any case to talk to. And, um, and when you, when you, I, I collaborated with, um, with a, a male curator who was a, a specialist in um, Renaissance, late Renaissance art, and we worked on this show together and had the most sort of robust series of what the British call robust debates, which means out and out conflict. And, um, and it was, and it took us probably about three months to realize that both of us were using the word realism in totally, with totally different meanings attached to it. So the idea of trying to find a common language is a, is a real challenge, even within the very, very tiny little context of art history. So, you know, what we're trying to do here is enormous. Dissonance is a beautiful thing, by the way. Dissonance is a great thing, you know. Not agreeing is a great thing at the same time. Multiple perspectives. Yeah, but you have to you have to end up with an exhibition. So you know, th there's a limit to how much dissonance one can one can sort of um, encapsulate into the process. But absolutely, you know, the tension is very important and the debate is very important. But I think you know, to to your point about about working with colleagues and putting things up on the walls in with colleagues who are not necessarily 20th century people. There, there are a couple of things, actually, I wanted to, to raise. One is that, um, and this goes to museology, and, you know, maybe we don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but, you know, the putting together of an historic artwork that is by, you know, a woman long dead and a contemporary um, female artist is actually quite difficult to do. It doesn't really matter what gender they are. It's incredibly difficult to do meaningfully. The other point that I wanted to, and so you have to really understand, A, what the artist is trying to do, but B, really understand the work itself and how to then put them in juxtaposition so that it doesn't become this kind of banal intervention that so many museums get engaged in all the time. The second thing which I'm really interested in, and I'd love to hear what you think too, Reem, and, and that is that as the... As the idea of the body politic has, ga has gained more kind of traction, particularly with revolutions or um, the manifestations in the street of people protesting, what's interesting to me is in this era of technology and, uh, you know, and digital wherewithal, people still take their bodies onto the street to be... to. to to make a statement, but also to be counted. It's about numbers. You remember the Trump fabrication? But it is about numbers. And the, the, the body, and particularly the female body, then has become, as I see it, and maybe you don't, and I'd be interested to know, um, more and more predominant in painting particularly, but also in sculpture too, where figuration and 
the human or the, the female figure doesn't necessarily need to be realistic, but the female figure within art has become much more ubiquitous than it used to be. This varies, of course, from time to time, but at the moment it seems to be there's a kind of resurgence that, of course, is, you know, fed and aided and abetted by the market. You know, there's, there's a whole load of other um, forces in play here. But nonetheless, artists in their studios generally tend to be making figuration. There are, there are plenty of exceptions here, but, but in, the balance seems to be changing. But do you feel that? Reem, do you? I mean, I've, I mean, I'm, I'm just putting up a show now, as I mentioned to Farah Al Qasimi uh, uh, at, at the Culture Foundation, where you know figuration abounds in her artwork, and and it's a lot of women in you know in kind of veiled consumerist, um, playful uh, mechanisms, but the body is abound in her work for sure, um, and I think. Uh, in, in very much, I, I, you know, as we do as curators, we, we lend ourselves through the work of these artists. And here's a young artist, um, young of age, obviously, um, and but at the same time, uh, with a illustrious uh, uh, work that is is looking critically at gender norms and um, uh, gender morphology in her society. Uh, she's not doing that without that gendered uh, lens. Um, and I think you're right. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've seen a lot, uh, maybe uh, within my expertise of the region itself, but not, ju not just. Um, we've seen a lot of our, um, uh, I, I want to say, African-American artists that have rendered more images and, uh, and, uh, and portraiture and figures uh, and, uh, and realist paintings in many, in, in many ways. Uh, I think also we have to uh, contend with the idea that uh, there's a plethora of more of the um, uh, African artists that are coming to the fore from, uh, from uh, a variety of places that we're starting to be aware of. And they also um, uh, have practiced the, the, the art of the figure in a, uh, in, a, in a very serious way. And we've come to normalize that as much. So I think between all of these variants, um, you know, the figure is starting to normalize ever more. And I think, you know, in here in the context of what we see at the Biennale, you see a lot of female figures also in the context of performance. We have the extraordinary Madwa Mugait uh, video, and of course you have Sara Brahim that is uh, both male and female, but Madwa Mugait um, and in person, you know, and, and for many, uh, that was just completely radical to have a group of female dancers, you know, not covered, wearing, um, you know, tunics, and brought many of the audience to tears in the first three days, um, in which she performed it here, and it was so moving because, of course, it was an acknowledgement that this wouldn't have happened in Saudi Arabia before this moment of radical transformation, but also that it was just speaking to a very deeply moving and powerful movement of oneself. So this idea of going to the streets and of women being out uh, and, and being in society or being a part of a, a protest. I think you're right. It, it's somehow easier also to romanticize the female figure and to then look at it in the context of what your Renaissance colleague would be looking and seeing. Um, in that way then, how, how does something then become not then just so prosaic for, you know, that there's too much female figuration or this idea that we had, what, a few years ago, the zombie formalism painting movement. I mean, we're, we're getting onto a really heady topic and that is, um, and that is the power of the market um, and which has increased enormously, um, both through galleries, through auction houses, through independent advisors, that, that it's, it's become an enormous, enormous um, sort of ecology or infrastructure. Um, and more and more difficult, I think, to sort of separate out the kind of, uh, and collectors, of course, are super important um, within, this, with, within this kind of network. And I, I, I guess, you know, it's another, it's another question that we've, 
or another topic that we've been talking about, which is the, is the growth of collectors in different regions that haven't necessarily, or you know, either had museums or a tradition of collecting or galleries. Um, and I don't know quite where to start with this, actually. The, I mean, the, the answer is so huge, and I think, you know, we, we're all seeing this. It doesn't matter where we are, whether we're in, uh, you know, Beirut, sad, you know, and poor Beirut, but nonetheless, you know, there are many, there's the gallery infrastructure there is huge, and it's growing here as well. Um, I think it's just, you know, as curators, we have additional responsibilities, more than we did even 10 years ago, let alone when I started my career. Um, it's, it's, you have to be very, very savvy about the way that things work. And ultimately, you know, although it sounds cliched and, you know, deeply conventional, but ultimately it's, it's what outs is, of course, quality. And how do you determine that quality? Well, that's, you know, the whole how, big how long have we got? <laughs> but. And, and, and actually on that point, you know, you know, there is a power in that knowledge of, um, especially where the art market is and where collectors have a role to play. Um, uh, the informed collector that, you know, can support with, through this art market, uh, the many female artists is, you know, this is something that is really important. Uh, uh, you know, we know in the end of the day that these art markets wield a lot of, uh, power behind the fences, behind everything. Um, and, uh, and that kind of turns its way back into museums, back into histories. Um, this role of patronage has a really kind of uh, important effect to play. Um, and I think it's, it's it, you know, it's very important for us to say for burgeoning collectors within the region itself, that they are also, um, you know, male and female, they're implicated in building that roster of support for uh, female artists around us, for sure, and normalizing that practice. Absolutely, yeah. And we have just a few minutes left, but I think, you know, something we haven't touched upon, um, interestingly, is also just this idea of why, you know, some of the, the more time-sensitive circumstances in which women do find themselves not a part of the workplace or not able to go to the studio. Uh, and, you know, you are both, you know, working mothers and, you know, had to balance that work-life mode. I mean, you know, and as an artist, you know, we see that within so many of, you know, the themes like Louise Bourgeois, of course, and, and, and this idea of motherhood or and then lost motherhood, Tracy Emmett, I mean, the list goes on. And, you know, often the articles we read about, you know, why, you know, do, do women kind of come back in their older years uh, and then gain recognition when they're in their, you know, 60s, 70s and are able then to continue working and w do some of their greatest work in their more elderly years because they're able to kind of turn and focus on that after having raised their children. And in the context of what we see in, I think especially here in Saudi Arabia with such a young population and still coming to terms with, you know, what is going to be the female role in the home, you know, what, you know, how, is a woman going to go to work, but then she's also the sole caretaker of her family and her, you know, the 1950s Mad Men style America. Like, what will that look like in the next five years in Saudi and, and really anywhere? I mean, how, you know, how have you seen that or balanced it for yourselves or seen that in the work of the artists that you have worked with? Well, I'm a different generation. <laughs> Um, but I also was very fortunate in having a partner who shared it with me. And we worked full time, but we, you know, I mean, logistically it's possible to do, but it can only happen if there are two of you, and there may not be two of you, um, if you can come to an accord. And that is again, you know, this is not just about the lot of the woman, it's the lot of the, of the couple and what you decide to do. I think, you know, to go back to some of the earlier comments, one of the things that made me, I was just thinking about this just now actually, that I went to my daughter's, um, what's it, um, when, when you go to university and you have a sort of keynote speech, that's or, it, yeah, a keynote speech by the, the dean of the university, it happened to be an American one. And the dean of the university was, is female, was female. Um, and she gave this speech, which was extraordinary, which was about 
and she said something like, I know that amongst you out there, there are many of you who feel as if you're suffering from imposter syndrome and that you couldn't possibly be in this Ivy League university, you know, and it must be a mistake. And I just thought, what a stupid thing to say. You know, I mean, honestly, talk about perpetuating, you know, the, a sense of sort of um, uncertainty instead of saying, you know, you're here because you're fantastic, you know, and we're so pleased to see you. So we, you know, we need to reinforce some of this. You know, it's not just about the kind of old, you, you know, to, to Reeb's sort of very strong statement earlier, I'm not sure I agree with you about taking, taking, taking all the time, but I think it's, but I still think it's about being assertive and, and knowing, and this is one of the things that does distinguish women and has done for a long, long time, and that is, I think, a growth of emotional in intelligence that we have had to create in order, or grow rather, and develop in order to survive in some of these institutions where you devote a huge amount of energy to negotiating internal politics when you could actually be flowing that energy into something more creative. But in order to survive and grow and go up the totem pole, you have to be, and I, you know, it's still, it's still unfortunately, this, you know, tr true, you have to be super aware of how you negotiate the, the internal situation in order to place yourself in such a place where you can, you know, d decide or determine the acquisition of a work by a woman, or you know, make an argument for the next exhibition to be by a female artist, and you know, that's not inconsiderable. It's actually quite difficult, um, but you have to play it, and you're, and it is literally playing it. Yes, absolutely playing the 100%. game. One hundred percent. Uh, 100%. Uh, and I just on the note on being a mother, uh, you know, because I'm new to it, <laughs> but I completely agree with you, Sheena. I mean, thankfully for my husband, who's a better mother than I am, had we not been, you know, two at the game, and he's even more than I am shouldering a lot of the responsibility, I would not be able to go back into the workforce and, you know, start to do a lot of my projects and take it on. But I have to say that what I found to be a lack, because as a new mother, as someone who I want to be there for my child, right? Like, especially in the first year, in this very formative and very crucial first year, I want to be there for her well-being. I want to be there to, uh, to, to be a presence in her, how she learns to speak or walk or do things. And I think it's very important for us to assert the important work that we do as mothers across that because in the end of the day I'm I'm trying to build a you know another human being that will be a, a crucial part of this society and we all have a role to do in that and at the same time as uh, I I think normalizing our motherhood has not happened as much right as working women and I think uh, and and how much work we put into that uh, and uh, and trying to say that if I don't attend the meeting because I pref like I would prefer to put my daughter to sleep and that is a sacred time and I do not want to receive phone calls or, you know, that is something that I, I feel has to be vocalized. And women need to start to say these things and put those boundaries. But at the same time, that does not, you know, lessen from their career path or the way we, that we kind of project ourselves or move forward. Um, and, um, and yes, we have to do it with more confidence and, um, uh, an assertion. Um, so and, and negotiation, I mean, really, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Negotiation all the way. Well, on that note, on the, the topic of equity and parity, uh, I just want to say thank you to Sheena, uh, Wagstaff and Reem Fadda. And we have time for, I think, uh, a couple of questions, maybe one or two questions in the audience. And we have a mic here. So we have a question. Right here. Thank you. Thank you very, very much to the panel. I've really enjoyed your discussions and what you had to say. It's inspiring. Um, I'm Mary Kelly. I'm an art historian from University College Cork in Ireland. Um, we've touched on the role of the museum. We've touched on artists. We've slightly touched on universities. But I think more needs to be said about universities. 
and the role of art historians. Because, and forgive me, I'm going to speak from a European perspective, but if a young student chooses to go into an art history program in Europe, their first year program is going to be white, male, um, European, American. That's very problematic because that gives a foundation. And then option modules look at women artists, artists from the Middle East. So there are others through option modules. And I think until we address that, along with addressing museums and encouraging artists, you know, the, the conversation won't change around women artists because we are training the next generation of art historians, the next generation of curators. I totally agree. I'm I don't think I can say much more than that. I mean, I don't. Um, Me neither. This was well said. Yeah, and I think, you know, maybe just expanding on that, I think it's, you know, we talked a little bit about, like, the structural problems and having to look and examine, look at and examine them. So it's for, you know, each and every one of us to, you know, speak to the people who perhaps you went, where you went and, you know, did your art history program. Where did you do your PhD? And you know, maybe go back and talk to your professors and, you know, kind of try to readdress those issues from a new perspective. Um, I think the mentor uh, um, role is yeah. actually super important. And I mean, Reem touched on it a bit and I think it is something for all women. Um, it's especially, you know, the further you get in your career, the more that you can help younger women, younger colleagues, but younger women particularly on that path. Well, I have really to important. say, Thank you to Sheena for me doing my PhD. It was a conversation with Sheena and Venetia Porter, uh, who's all, uh, the curator of the 2139 show, who pushed me very much. I mean, literally threw me into my PhD program. So it is true. I mean, it is the mentorship of, of those around you. And often, often it will be like the female figures in your life, but it doesn't always have to be. It can also be, you know, the empowered male figures who you know, find that, and you know, I've been very lucky to have two male bosses in my career who have been unbelievably empowering to me. Uh, so that is absolutely a, a good point. Do we have one more question? I feel like, Tommy, you have to have a question. Um, first of all, I think you mentioned also since you started talking, went up. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> to your point, Gina, I feel like we accomplished something today. Um, I think, you know, what, what I find really interesting is men have been conditioned to not have to take an interest in the female perspective, right? Because that's how the world was running. And I think for a very long time, and this is less of a question and more just a thought and something to add, I think for the longest time, um, part of the strive and the struggle was to try and educate and bring them into the fold and attract their attention. And in, sometimes it was like, look here, shiny thing. Um, and, you know, it could have been, um, you talked before about the, the female figure, or it could have been a thought or a concept or something emotional. And I think what I see around me more and more, and I think this is actually very apparent in this Biennale as well, is a female perspective that is just so strong and engaging and um, exciting, um, that is clearly feminine, but also at the same time um, is a standout point of view that pulls you into a thought. And then you look at the wall and you realize it's a woman, or maybe you realize it by looking at the work. And I think Rim was saying before that as a woman, she just takes because you know nobody else gives her uh, you know the right otherwise or the right of the, of the way and 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 I I understand and I can relate you know when in many different ways um, and maybe less so as related to gender but in other ways but I do think um, that there's something about the power of women to not conquer, but infiltrate and gather and create and commune and bring. And I think it's really beautiful to see, especially today here in the Biennale, the power of the female point of view and how captivating it is just by being that and existing in a society that is male dominant. And I would argue, or I would like to think, 
that it might be a better way to grab a man's attention. Mm. I think I, I'm I actually wanted to say, yeah. sorry. No, please, please, I was Just gonna ask you so. both to comment on how do you negotiate when you discuss such things in, in a curatorial concept? Actually, exactly that, because um, it, one of the artists I worked with, Shadi Alam, a uh, Saudi, you know, f fabulous artist who uh, is residing in Paris. And uh, I wanted her to work with me on the Desert X exhibition that is now uh, up in Al Ula. And um, she did a magnificent piece uh, for those who haven't seen it. It's a metallic, uh, it's a metallic like flower that, that looks like a, a star like flower, a shape from an origami uh, a shape of paper, you know, these origami shapes that look like a flower or a star. And it's a, a large sheet that is like a metallic sheet um, sculpture, three, three meter by three meter, standing in the sand in various colors that abound. And she, she actually talks about, the, with the title of the work and her intention, she wrote such a beautiful poetic text that this was a star that fell onto the earth and wanted to become a flower. And that's exactly to, back to the, person who was just speaking now so beautifully, you know, that's the female, in my interpretation, that's the female voice that, you know, just wants to live, you know, wants to become, not to conquer, not to go back into the stars and conquer this, conquer space. But in fact, it's a star that wants to live amidst the flowers. It wants to be like one with nature and one with its surroundings um, uh, in, in a language of parody and beauty um, and simplicity, um, and, and, and I think that's a, a very kind of strong uh, narrative. Interesting, I, when I was um, there, and um, yesterday, whenever it was, day before, um, I, the, I remember playing that game, um, and, it's, you, you, and girls and boys play it, um, and of course, when you, when you open it up and you flip open the inside, it gives you little um, uh, predictions or wishes, and they're all about the future. Um, and they can be male and female, uh, and, and that's how I understood it. And there were two guys who were also visiting who, said, who recognized it immediately and, re and related to it. So I think, you know, that piece went further. But I think what, you know, just to Tom's point, I think what you're talking about, and, what, and again, it's, an, it's a challenge, and I see it all the time in museums and in the cultural sector, is that women generally are seen as fantastic enablers. You know, they're consensus builders, they, they manage people incredibly well, they do all that stuff. But what they're not seen, and what they are, are visionaries. And when you create a really great program of exhibitions, it's very interesting to see how the comparison between the acknowledgement of, you know, within the media, within um, male peers particularly, there isn't the same acknowledgement. And there is, there is that, that is another sort of embedded bias that is incredibly difficult to shift. Um, and the only means by which one measures that, I find, is by hearing artists, male and female, responding to those, to those programs. Well, thank you. I cannot think of a better finish than saying women are visionaries and they are enabled and empowered at the Diria Biennale Foundation. Thank you. <laughs>